Welcome to day four of problem solving with Smithsonian experts. We are so glad that you're joining us for today's topic, which is about understanding and sustaining a biodiverse planet. If it's your first time joining us for a Smithsonian online conference or during the course of today's uh, this this current series, we wanted to make sure that you were comfortable with how things worked and that you'd be able to interact with us because that's why we do these sessions live. We'd like you to feel like you are here in conversation with us here at the Smithsonian and with each other. We've got quite a collection of people joining us from all across the world. You're beginning to see some of your fellow participants introduce themselves here and we would love to hear about your interest in the topic. So go ahead and tell us uh, about your interest in biodiversity and maybe our current session in particular. We're going to start in a moment talking about what do modern animal bones tell us about biodiversity. It's a very different perspective and approach to studying this that I think you're going to find fascinating. We'll hear from Brianna in just a moment. After that session, we're going to talk about how can we learn about nature's most elusive animals, and we're going to go from Africa to South America and go into the rainforests and find out about some animals that most people never meet or know about. What's more, see in any form. You're going to learn a lot about that and biodiversity. And then we'll do a very different look in a different rainforest also though in South America and find about find out about animals that are much smaller than the ones that we'll see in our second session we're going to look at beetles and you're going to love learning about how and why we count living things like beetles so tune into that session as we round out the day we'll also have a special closing uh, a few remarks from some special guests who'll join us at the end of the day we hope you'll be with us then as well do note we are closed captioning our sessions, and you'll see my words appearing in real time thanks to our friends at WGBH who are captioning all of our sessions. If you do not need the captions appearing on your screen, you can click the CC button on the right side of the screen in the captioning area and then change the display menu to none if you need or want to turn those off. As I mentioned, you can send your questions and comments in on the left side of the screen, as many of you are. We do know we have many groups today who are joining us from large group settings where they might be watching in, on a big screen. So welcome to all of you in those groups. If you have a cell phone, you can text your messages in if you're not near the keyboard or you don't want to keep bothering the person at the keyboard. So you can send the word chat followed by your message to the text number 22. 333. That's two twos and three threes. Send the word chat and then your message and we'll get those coming in as well. And finally, if you're using Twitter and you prefer to interact with us that way, you can send the word chat uh, prefaced with at poll and then whatever follows all that will come to us as well. So greetings to all of you who are sending your welcomes to all of us. I also want to mention that joining us uh, is Dan Porter, who is an illustrator and he joins us from Kent, England, where he is creating a virtual illustration of our time together. If you haven't seen the uh, illustrations yet during the course of our conference, we're in the process of continually posting those wonderful illustrations that provide yet a different way of capturing the conversation that we all have together. So we'll check in with Dan between sessions and give you a glimpse as to the work that he is doing. So thank you, Dan. Finally, uh, before we get started, a little extra housekeeping before our first session today, so thanks for bearing with me. We do have all of the recordings from the prior three days posted on the site on the program page, so don't forget you can check those out. They'll be up indefinitely, so come back and visit and share them with your friends. And do check out the exhibit hall where we've got lots of resources that relate to all of the topics we're exploring from a wide array of Smithsonian museums, units, research centers, and other resources, so check that out. Finally, let me thank Smithsonian Education, which is uh, the Smithsonian Center for Education and Museum Studies for sponsoring and convening our event. Uh, I also want to acknowledge the Smithsonian's Office of the Chief Information Officer, which lends great support to the event as well. I'm Jonathan from Learning Times, and we're so pleased to be a partner with the Smithsonian on this great project. And finally, Microsoft Partners in Learning has graciously supported our series, and we thank them. Now it's time for our first event, uh, Brianna Pobener joins us from the Human Origins Program. If you've been to the National Museum of Natural History, you not only have seen some of her work, but you might have actually seen her on some of the big video screens they've got in the Human Origins exhibit, a really amazing uh, uh, part of the museum. So do check it out if you're in D.C. But you have one step better today. You get live Brianna Pobener talking to us about 
well, bones. <laughs> and it's going to be a great session, and I'm going to turn the floor over to her now to introduce herself and her topic. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, make sure everybody can hear me. So I'm going to be talking about what modern animal bones can tell us about biodiversity. Um, the first thing I want to ask everybody is what kind of animal do you think this bone belongs to? Anybody have any guesses? Let's find out, Brianna. We've put the, we've put the question up at the top left, and we're starting to get some responses coming in. Um, of course. Uh, oh, wow. We, uh, we have it. Let's see. A horse, an ungulate, a zebra, a goat. Uh, I think somebody has the right answer. So everybody who said herbivore and horse is pretty close. This is actually a zebra. So um, my setting for my research is in Africa, so we'll keep that in mind as we go forward. So when I see this, um, I know that it's the jawbone of a zebra, and um, I know that... Um, it could be, you know, the jawbone of a, um, an individual that's related to some of these zebras. Um, and, okay, so that's great. But what does this tell us about biodiversity? Um, so what can bones tell us about biodiversity? Um, so um, a brief definition of biodiversity, and there are a lot of them out there, um, is that biodiversity is the variation of life forms within a given ecosystem. And that's a very basic definition. Um, one measure of biodiversity is species diversity, and included in species diversity is the number and relative proportions of species in an ecosystem. So how many species are there, and in what proportions are they uh, represented in an ecosystem? Which one is the most uh, uh, common, and, and so forth. Um, how is large mammal species diversity and especially changes in biodiversity over time measured? There's a variety of ways, and actually one of the afternoon sessions looks like it's going to touch on this as well. So one way to do it is with aerial count. So you can get in a plane, you can fly over a particular place, you can do some representative sampling and see how many different kinds of animals. Another way is with foot count. So this is actually going out on the ground, um, usually with some binoculars, usually with a, a fair number of people, and trying to count um, the numbers of animals. And bone counts. So this is a relatively new technique. What is bone counts? And why can it sometimes be lower in cost in terms of time and money than aerial and foot, uh, aerial and foot counts in terms of measuring especially changes in biodiversity? So that's really what I'm going to talk about today. Um, Here's an introduction to some of the herbivores and some or some of the um, uh, animals on the ecosystem that I work in, and we'll talk about the setting in a moment. Um, so to me, all of these animals, you can see a buffalo in the top left corner, some baboons, and going around to the right, a giraffe, zebra in the middle, um, black rhino, and then a, there's a variety of species of antelope. There's an impala in the middle, and then on the bottom left, there's an oryx. Um, so to me, um, I look at this and I can actually see those animals in the ecosystem. So this is a large um, antelope skull over here. Um, we have warthog over here. We have, um, this one happens to be um, the femur or leg bone of a zebra. Um, and some of these bones are more recognizable than others. So this is a rib bone. Sometimes these are really hard to figure out what animal they're from. So how do we go from these bones to getting that great picture of what kind of animals were around? Well, in 2009, there was a landmark paper published showing that bone assemblages, so the whole group of bones um, on a landscape, can track the community structure of animals. This study was done in Amboseli National Park in southern Kenya, um, and the authors did a combination of animal censuses and bone censuses over 40 years. Um, and we'll talk about what a bone census is in a minute. Um, so the graph on this side is basically comparing the proportion of um, animals represented in the living community with the proportion of animals down there, uh, portion of animals represented in the dead community, the bone community. You can see that it's a very good fit. Um, and the graph over here on the right shows that even um, if you just break the animals down by feeding type, here it's browsers versus mixed feeders, the bone community also tracks the living community. Okay, but so how do you know when an animal dies based on its bones? Because that's one of the things we need to figure out in order to track these changes. Um, bone gets weathered due to the elements. So 
there can be wind, there can be rain, there can be water, um, air, and especially changing conditions and weather can really have an effect on bones. The longer a bone has been on the ground, the more weathered it will be. So um, you can see here weather and characteristics that can be related to the time since death. There we go. Um, but there is, um, is there a formula to tell us how long a bone has been on the ground based on how weathered it is? Wouldn't that be nice? Well, it turns out that there is. Um, and so this might be a little bit tricky to read, but um, bones go through weathering stages, and these stages leave telltale signs on the bones themselves. Um, so the more a bone is out on the ground, um, the more weathered it will be. It will be cracked, it will be, um, some parts of it will be eroded away. Um, and there, if you can see, some of the descriptions um, of the weathering stages will go through a couple of bones and see if you could put these into particular weathering stages or which ones might be more weathered than others. Okay, so here is our first bone. Um, what stage of weathering would you put this bone into? Is this a bone that is hardly, you know, hardly been weathered, or it's been extremely weathered, or somewhere in the middle. And we, uh, Brianna, we've put uh, that question, that poll up on the top left, and allowed mm -hmm. people to see the bone here on the right as well. So uh, you can continue to take us great. through those stages, and people can vote as they think you hit the right one. All right, perfect. So it looks like we're coming to stage three, patches of rough weather. Okay. Um, there's some three, some stage four votes. Um, I would potentially call this a little bit less weathered, maybe somewhere around a one or a two. But let's look at the next one. Um, so what about this one? What stage of weathering would you put this, okay, this bone into? We have a vote for stage four, which has open cracks with rounded edges. So it looks like people think this is a little bit more weathered than the first one. I would tend to agree with that. Quick question, Brianna, that, that mm -hmm. comes in. So do all bones um, weather, all kinds of animal bones weather mm. according to these same stages? That's a very good question. There's now beginning to be some studies. So this particular study that a lot of the um, work I'm doing is based on was done in an African ecosystem. There are now beginning to be studies in more temperate ecosystems to see if the same weathering stage pattern holds up. So it's an open question. It's a very good question. Yes, so it looks like I would agree um, that this bone is probably in stage four. Um, it has open cracks and pretty rounded edges. All right, what about this next one? Does this one look a little bit more weathered, a little bit less weathered? We have a vote for the stage five. The bone is falling apart. Looks like we have more votes for stage five, and I would agree and we have some votes for stage four and so sometimes bones are kind of on the edge they can be potentially in one or or another of weathering stages but looks like we have a pretty good majority in stage five and i would agree with that okay so you guys are quickly becoming um, experts in diagnosing bone weathering stages so and here are some photos um, of um, a variety of bone weathering stages. So um, now that we can put bones into weathering stages, we can tell um, about how long ago a particular animal died and has been on the ground. Weathering stages have been correlated to years since death. So you can see weathering stages on the left um, and years since death on the right. Ooh, there we go. Um, so years since death on the right. Um, and so if you know when that animal died, you can actually start to look at changes over time in your animal populations. So um, now that this technique had been um, undertaken in an ecosystem in southern Kenya, I decided to study some bones in a game reserve in central Kenya called Ulpegeta Conservancy to see, number one, if this method still holds up, and number two, if I could see changes in the biodiversity there over time. So now we're going to take a little field trip. Um, so uh, Kenya is in um, the eastern part of Africa. So our arrow's right up here. That's about where we are. And um, the game reserve, uh, or the conservancy, is in central Kenya, in the Lakipia district. Um, it straddles the equator. And um, so I have a lot of fun um, visiting the equator as I'm driving into the conservancy on the top right. And then um, there's actually some signs in the conservancy where uh, 
that you're right on the equator. Um, so based on what we've talked about so far, what factors might be useful in picking a place to do this kind of study? That's a good question, Brian. We've, we've put it up on the screen now so people can, can think about that for a moment. Um, we do have a couple of questions that have quickly come in. Uh, one is, uh, we were talking about whether different climates mm. might affect the way that bones age or weather. Mm -hmm. uh, do, but do all animal bones weather the same rate um, by species, too? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, that's a little bit of an unknown variable. So that's something that I think um, we're right now assuming that in general they do. Certainly we know that birds, which have more hollow bones, don't um, weather exactly the same way as mammal bones. So I do think that I it's likely that within larger classes, um, so herbivores, um, carnivores, but th I think that's still an open question, actually, something that we need to do some more experimental studies on. So um, maybe you can walk us through some of the factors that would be useful. Sure. So place. one factor is that um, I wanted to go to a place where they had fairly high biodiversity. So if I wanted to see changes in biodiversity over time, I want to go to a place where there's a lot of different animal species. The other thing is I wanted to go to a place where they're already doing some counts of the animals, at least in the past couple of years. Very good. So I see um, a place that has been relatively undisturbed. That's a really good f um, uh, factor in a place that I would want to pick to do a study like this. Someone uh, also uh, from Open University pointed out safety would be a factor. Yeah, safety is a factor. So I'll talk a little bit about the safety measures that I take um, uh, in a little while. Um, it's a good point. So. Um, between 1996 and 2003, um, there have been some foot censuses going on on Olpegeta Conservancy, um, which is a really good start in documenting change over time. So you can see that um, on the left-hand side, there are um, Birchall zebra, which is the common zebra um, in Africa, is the most common um, mammal, followed by warthog, followed by impala and buffalo. So we're really talking about a lot of um, grazing animals. Um, so the next step in our project is we want to compare our bone counts to the animal counts, the proportions of bones. So do we see more zebra than warthog, than impala, than buffalo in our bone counts? If this works, we can use the bone counts to see how the animal community structure may have changed over time. Now these animal counts have not been going on for the past 40 years, maybe only for the past 10 in this ecosystem. But what we can do with bone counts is actually look further back in time. Um, we can also do one more thing. We can see how predation may have been part of um, the animal community structure change over time. Um, so that's where we'll talk a little bit about that at the end and how predators can have an impact on your animal community structure. But first I want to talk a little bit more about, um, so here's a couple of the predators um, on the game reserve. Lions are the most dominant predator. Um, and uh, leopards are fairly uncommon. Here's a striped hyena. There's also spotted hyenas. Um, and here, and off in the distance, is a cheetah. When I was initially starting this study, cheetahs were locally um, extirpated or sort of locally extinct, but um, they've now actually come back onto the reserve, as have wild dogs. So that's pretty exciting. I think at this point, we, we have a couple of questions about mm -hmm. clarifying, I think, net with some more context. Earlier, you talked about the living community versus the bone community. We're right. looking at the living community. Um, so there's a request to clarify again. Um, so you've got these animals. Why, again, right. are you studying the bones? The bones. Okay, so the bones um, can be useful because, first of all, we can go in and do a quick census. We can do a variety of um, wa uh, bone walks and be able to get a census in a short amount of time. Um, so we can go out in a couple of weeks and get a good sense in all of these different habitats um, what, an what the animal community was like. We can also look over time um, during times that there were no other censuses by foot or by plane or anything, we can look back and change and trace maybe over decade scales how the animal community has changed over time. So it's a really, um, it's a really important new tool to be able to look at um, ecosystems, especially ones that are under conservation and management, to see how some of these an animal communities have changed over a longer scale of time. Um, somebody asked if bone survey is cheaper. Um, I would argue absolutely yes. Um, so it, 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 um, if you have scientists who are well trained in being able to identify bones, um, you don't need as many people and you don't need as long a time as actually be, to be out in the field to be able to trace these um, changes in biodiversity. So I think the answer to that question is yes. 
Um, so well, another great thing that Olpegeta has, and this is one piece of Olpegeta that has been um, where the vegetation has all been ground truthed using GIS. So I'll show you some pictures. Um, you can see the black in the middle are areas of plains. Um, you can see that on the left hand side there's a river running north south. That's the Owasso Nero River. Um, and there are some tributaries that are flowing east-west off the river that are only flowing seasonally. But it gives you a little bit of the structure where the hilly parts in black are, are higher in elevation, um, uh, divided by low-lying areas with intermittently flowing streams. Um, and here's some pictures of some of the vegetation. So there are yellow fever trees, which are really indicative of um, riverine areas. And the most common bush in this particular area is called euclea. And so that's um, a picture of a euclea. And on the top right are some close up of euclea leaves. Um, good question I see came in. Am I counting bones on the surface of the land? What about buried or partially buried bones from? Yes, I do count those. And I think I may have one picture of a partially buried bone. But I think actually. Um, um, that's a really important thing to count. Um, so here's a little bit of just what the scenery looks like with Mount Kenya in the background. Um, so this is a little bit of a mixed um, grassland and woodland area. Um, and here's another little shot of scenery with more open areas. Um, so I will continue and talk a little bit about exactly how we figure out um, what this bone community looks like. So here is my car. Um, I hop into my land cruiser and somebody asked about safety. So it's a rule on the game reserve that all researchers um, need to have an armed guard um, while we're outside of the car and walking around. So, um, uh, and there's a variety of reasons for this and it is, um, for safety um, because there are a lot of animals uh, that we can encounter when we're walking around. Elephants, buffalo, lions, and a whole variety of other dangerous animals. Um, I have had, I've never had a really close encounter, but I've had close enough encounters that I am very grateful to have an armed guard with me. Um, Okay, so um, what we do to do our bone transects is drive to our transect starting location and uh, we pick transects based on particular habitats. So we want to do transects um, that are wholly, which is why that GIS map of vegetation is so useful, do transects that are entirely in grasslands or entirely in woodlands. Um, and I try to do them also um, facing north, south, or east, west because it's a lot easier to follow my GPS if I'm facing due north or facing due west. Really? In addition to flatlands being easier for you to explore and traverse, does it also affect the likelihood that bones will be remaining in a certain place? It does. So um, one of the factors um, that we take into consideration when we're doing our bone transects is how the, is the visibility, basically. So um, in, an, in a bushy area, which you can see me walking into in the background part of the slide, um, it's a lot harder to find bones in a bushy area than it is in an open area. So we can correct for that when we're figuring out basically the area that we've covered on our bone transect. Um. Okay, so we do a lot of walking. Um, so uh, so this would be one of those easier areas. So we can estimate how wide, it, you know, can we see 10 meters wide, 30 meters wide. We can see the, the furthest distance from the center of the transect to where the bone is, and that helps us calculate the area that we've actually been able to cover. Um. So a very important tool. Um, I use a GPS not only to trace the bone transect that I'm walking on, but to mark every individual bone or bone scatter. Later we can put this on a map and we can start to see if there are patterns to where particular bones are. So are there more likely to be bones in open habitats or closed habitats? And that's a big question that we want to answer. Oh, somebody asked if this could be done in a wet tropical forest. I do think it could. I, it hasn't been done yet before, but I think that would be an interesting thing to test. Um, they're, they're also curious if it would still be a cheap, cheap yeah, method if it were in that environment. That's a good question. Um, I, I do think it probably would be. I think certainly in tropical rainforests, the, um, it may be even harder to do foot censuses and, and aerial censuses of animal populations. So I think it would be an interesting thing to test. Um, Although tropical soils do tend to break down bones a lot quicker, so um, that would one thing that would be one thing it would have going against us. Um, somebody asked how the armed bodyguard would protect me. They often will um, shoot into the air to scare animals away. Um, is a first line of defense. So um, that would be if if animals came too close. Although I've had. Um, um, lions and things actually run away because they're not used to seeing people 
on um, on the ground and outside of the cars. Okay, so I collect a lot of data at each particular bone occurrence. Um, so I'm try I, I look to see um, what kind of animal the bone is from, and that is based on a long time of study of being able to um, identify bones from different kinds of animals. The GPS location, what kind of habitat the bone is in, how many bones from each animal are represented, and of course, what weathering stage is there. So that's just some of the data that I'm collecting, and here's a copy of my data sheet. And we do have a full screen button uh, that you'll see on the slides. If you'd like to blow this up for a moment and take a look at it more closely while I ask a, a question that's come in for Brianna. Mm -hmm. um, I know we're gonna we're gonna get get to a couple of these, but sure. he, here's one from from Patty in Seneca Valley. How do you mm -hmm. know that multiple bones didn't come from the same animal if they're spread apart? That's a good question, um, and that a lot of the times multiple bones do come from the same animal. So the thing that we have to be really good at is being able to identify. Um, okay, is this a left lower leg bone from a particular animal, and are the, all the other bones here from that same type of animal, from a zebra or from an elephant? Um, so we will usually assume they are from the same animal if um, unless we can find um, a repeat of a certain bone. So if you find two left lower leg bones of giraffes and you know there were two different individuals there. Great. That's a good question. Um, oh, so, and there you go. So these, um, this is a, a good example of um, a bone scatter that I might encounter, and I would have to um, look and make sure that this bone is the same kind of animal as this bone, as all the other bones here. And if they're not, because sometimes you can get one bone from another animal mixed in. So it really takes careful looking at all of the bones to figure out what animals they're from. Do you find yourself, when looking at a scene like this, um creating a story in your mind about what happened here? Well, certainly. I mean, and, and um, uh, I can look at the weathering. I can look to see if there's any um, gnawing marks or, or tooth marks from carnivores, which I'll talk about in a bit, you know, and I can, I can start to estimate how long ago this particular animal died, how scattered the bones are, um, because the longer an animal um, carcass has been on the ground, the more scattered the bones will be. So absolutely, you can really start to, to construct stories about some of these individual animals. In fact, Diane, who joins us from Florida, said it's almost like animal CSI, crime scene <laughs> investigation. Absolutely. So, um, and it takes a lot of different kinds of, of um, techniques to really look at, um, at these animals. Okay, so um, all this knowledge isn't just in my head. Um, so we have what uh, we affectionately call Mrs. Walker's Bone Book um, among East African mammal osteologists. It was written by a woman called Ricky Walker. Um, and this really helps us with bone identifications. Um, so for instance, here's a variety of drawings of the shoulder blade or scapula of different animals. Um, and there are drawings from different angles of the same bone. So it's very helpful to have a copy of this out in the field when we get stumped and say, okay, well, there are these two animals and they look very similar to each other and I'm not kind of sure which bone this is. And, and sometimes we can't actually um, identify these to certainty. Okay, so is everybody ready to be an animal CSI specialist? <laughs> um, which of the four animals do you think these horns are from? Let's see how I did this. Um, okay, so your choice A is um, a Grant's gazelle. Your choice B is a water buck. Um, C is an impala, and these are all kinds of antelope. And D is a buffalo. So let's see what everybody thinks. Looks like we have a lot of votes for the Grant's Gazelle hmm. and some votes for the water buck. It's good. And, and actually, um, uh, even in the fossil record, we can use the shape of um, horn cores, which is the bony part inside. You can see the keratin sheath outside the um, these bones up here. But we, we use these a lot in the fossil record to be able to identify particular antelopes. All right, I think you guys have it. So you are right. We have 69% voted, 67% voted for the Grants Gazelle. And that is exactly what who those horns are from. So, so is everyone job. who's joining us today coming with you on your next trip? Absolutely. I love, I'd love to take lots of volunteers. And um, that's a good segue. So I am not, uh, I don't do this work alone. Um, right now, I am co-directing this project with um, Dr. Fyer Kravarovic, who is a lecturer at Durham University in the United Kingdom. Um, and Fyer's specialty 
um, is actually measuring animal bones um, to look at, to be able to identify what type of locomotion a particular animal had based on measurements of its bones. Um, so we are a really good team. We're investigating um, uh, these long-term changes in uh, biodiversity by looking at, fire can also look at changes in the locomotion of animals, which is related to changes in the habitat types. Um, Another thing that we really enjoy doing is that um, we take different um, guards with us every time we go into the field. So it's really um, a way for us to help train some of the Kenyan staff on the game reserve who can then bring this knowledge back to the other guards and they get really interested in being able to identify bones and um, taking a closer look at bones so you can see fire in the top right um, using a magnifying glass to take a little bit of a closer look at bones. and. Um, and so we've had our, our um, guards get, you know, they're really big helps and they get really interested in what we're doing. Can I ask you a quick question that's mm -hmm. come in here from one sure. of our students at Milford Middle, uh, Middle School? Um, the, the question is, how long should an animal be dead before it's okay to pick up the bones? Mm. And I think it's worth mentioning, too. What do you do with the bones after you examine them? That's a good question. We actually leave the bones in place after we examine them. And part of that reason is because we're interested in seeing, um, we want to go back to some of the same exact bone scatters. And that's why we use a GPS to take the exact location. Um, so we want to go back to some of these bone scatters and document this weathering patterns and see if the, if the weathering patterns um, are consistent with the previous study. Um, the other thing that we always make sure to do is that if it's a fresh kill, we make sure that there are no carnivores around. And in mm -hmm. fact, um, a lot of the bones, when, when we're looking at these bones, we, we really don't um, look at bones that have any kind of flesh still left on them. So we'll leave those until our next field season and just sort of note that they're there. Um, is is a, a bone that has no flesh on it still a source of curiosity for a living predator? Yeah, that's a good question. So it certainly could be hyenas, which are um, uh, uh, traditionally known as scavengers in East African ecosystems. Um, vultures and all kinds of insects would definitely still be interested because even if there's no flesh left on the bones, it still has marrow and grease. They still have marrow and grease in them. So um, we're, we're also very careful about washing our hands and making sure not to really pick up anything that, that has bugs on it or anything like that. Um, knock on wood, we've, we've both stayed pretty healthy so far. One more question about the guards. You talked sure. about their interest and the knowledge you share with them and vice versa. Do the guards also help you in traditional environmental knowledge capacity? That's a question from Lisa. That's absolutely the case. And so we do sort of some cross training where we help train the guards in being able to identify, it, which I'll get to in a bit, um, what kinds of predators may be um, preying on particular animals. But they do help us with um, just um, knowledge about the um, environment, knowledge about the vegetation, knowledge about the animals and their behavior. So it's a really good exchange. Absolutely. So you can see fire taking photographs. We take photos of every single bone and every single bone patch that we encounter. Um, and this is fire getting really excited to find a huge animal bone. Um, does anyone have a guess what animal this bone could be from? And I'll give you a hint. Um, this bone is the bone that in a human actually goes from your elbow to your wrist. So you can see how much bigger it is in this particular animal. Elephant, giraffe, those are good. We've got a bunch of elephant votes. <laughs> Let's That's see. not a political statement. <laughs> That's very funny. <laughs> Young giraffe, a hippo. Very good. So these are all very good. And it turns out this is actually part of a giraffe, ske uh, giraffe um, skeleton. So it's the radius of a giraffe. Um, and both giraffe and elephant are good guesses because this kind of habitat is where both of those animals live. So very good. By the way, we have a question from mm -hmm. Kenya, from Kari, who wants yep. to know um, how... Have you come close to being attacked by a predator while collecting? I have not, thankfully. Um, I We will be careful when we're doing our bone transects, and we will abort a transect if there are if there's a group of lions or um, some other kind of predator in the area, because we can always just go back the next day to that particular transect. So um, we, we try to be safe um, as much as we can, because that's the most important concern. Um, I see a question from Stan um, from Brownfield, Texas, asking if um, we find more zebra bones than other bones, and the answer is yes. So although we haven't actually done a lot of our analysis yet to compare the bone and the um, animal communities from the, from the census counts, um, so far it looks like our method works pretty well. 
Um, okay, so this is our team from uh, our 2008 field season. Um, and I wanted to give you a little sense of where we stay. So this is the Olpegeta Research Center. Um, it's a converted horse stable that has six bedrooms, um, four bathrooms inside. There's um, the bathrooms. I'll have a toilet, sink, a shower. Um, there's an office at one end on the right end, and there's a kitchen at the other end. Um, and there are two accessory, what are called rondavels. They're round houses, um, and they are divided into four bedrooms each. So this house is a fair number of people. And between Fire and I, um, there's also an Earthwatch project that is run on this game reserve that's there about five months out of the year, and there are some long-term studies going on at the same time. Um, there's a cook on duty all the time, and it is great to come home at the end of a long day walking, you know, five or six or seven miles to have a wonderful dinner. Um, there is electricity um, in the mornings and evenings from a generator, um, and the tank that you can see poking up right here um, is a tank that holds water and underneath that tank is a wood-burning fire. So that's our way to get hot showers. Um, so compared to a lot of other field conditions that I lived in, this is actually pretty cushy. Um, and it's a really a great place to spend time, especially because there are often other researchers there who are studying the modern ecosystem who um, we can learn from and we can collaborate with. Quick question from mm -hmm. our uh, colleagues, uh, 22 guests joining us from Palm Bay, Florida, where mm -hmm. the weather is probably quite nice most of the year. Mm -hmm. Their question is, <laughs> So there are certain times of your of the year that are better for the trek. That's a great question. So um, Kenya, this area of Kenya has um, two rainy seasons. It has the long rains, which start um, in March and go till the end of May. And then it has the short rains that usually start about middle or end of October and go towards usually um, and go until sometime in December. I was actually there one Christmas when it was pouring. Um, so the rainy seasons are not the best time to go because um, you can even see here um, some traces of of mud um, so it's actually really hard to get your car anywhere during the rainy season that's uh, besides the fact that it's really not fun to do transects in the rain um, but not being able to go anywhere is the biggest reason not to actually be there in the rainy season oh, it's a good question so here's another view of the research center where we stay um, and um, this is fire and I um, so the end of our day is not um, when we come home tired and sweaty and hungry from doing bone transects but we actually input all of our data um, into our computer and it can give us a sense of what bone transects we may want to do the next day so do we need more transects in particular ecosystems um, you know how is our work going compared to what we've expected to do that season um, I mentioned the rain before, so um, this is a view from one of our bone transects, which it looked absolutely bright and sunny out one day, and you can see the rain in the back. So about one kilometer at the very end of the transect, we got poured on, ran back to the car. It really wasn't that fun, but it's always an adventure. Um, okay, so I talked a little bit earlier about... Um, predation pressure. So one of the things that I did as part of my PhD research was looking at um, how um, bones can tell us about predation pressure and maybe how bones can determine how predation pressure in the conservancy has changed over time. So what I did was look at patterns of damage that different carnivores leave on bones when they eat their prey. Um, and most of the time what I looked at in this particular game reserve was lions. Um, and uh, um, so, um, um, this bone scatter is, to me, um, screams spotted hyena. So spotted hyenas are really specialized predators that have strong teeth for breaking up bones, and they do this because they want, they're actually able to consume bones and eat bone marrow. Um, and so, um, uh, if you see really damaged and destroyed bones, it's often because of spotted hyenas. <laughs> spotted hyenas often leave other telltale signs. Um, this is regurgitation, basically. So they eat bones, but then they um, and their uh, stomach acid is really strong, and they're able to actually digest and extract nutrients from bones. But sometimes it comes back up. So, or sometimes it comes out the other end. So you can often see hair and parts of undigested hooves from animals and things like that. And that's a really unique spotted hyena feature. Um, so I mentioned that I was, um, even though this is a whole separate study, I can't get into it in a lot of detail, but different kinds of carnivores do different levels of damage to bones. So you can see here on the picture on the right hand side that there are some more um, obvious markings 
So here's a really big tooth mark, um, and there are some tooth scores. Um, there are sort of linear marks that happen when um, uh, these happen to be samples from lions. Happens when lions' teeth, when they're um, in the middle of eating their prey. Um, and sometimes they even gnaw off parts of bone. So here um, is a part of a bone that's been gnawed off, and you can see actually the bottom half of this bone is gone. Um, and so here is a good example of the different levels of bone damage that um, carnivores can do. So there's, um, and I classify every single bone and every single part of a bone um, into one of four categories of damage, well, or five, because there could be no damage. But if there's any damage, it can be minimal, it can be moderate, um, where there's um, marginal gnawing, uh, where some of the bits of the end of the bone um, is chewed off. There's heavy gnawing, where both ends of the bone are gnawed off or absent. Um, and then there's this fragments only. And so even um, carnivores that aren't well adapted for chewing bones like lions or leopards or cheetahs can actually do a lot of damage to bones of small prey. Uh, Brianna, um, mm -hmm. a student in uh, Christina Stanfield's uh, elementary school class says, so if you find a lone carcass, can mm -hmm. you tell what animal killed or ate it? Sometimes you can. And actually, that's one of the things that I studied for my um, in my PhD, was I was looking at, um, uh, and there's a couple of, of factors that can help you with that. One is you need to know um, what ki well what kind of animal it was and what size animal it was. So a lot of times, um, large animals um, can be very well can be very damaged by large predators, um, but small animals, if you only have minimal damage, you can tell that the predator that ate it was probably small. Um, and then I've also done some experiments not only with um, carnivores on in this ecosystem, but also with captive carnivores to see how much damage they can do to different size bones. So the size of the animal that you started with is a really big factor in being able to tell what kind of animal killed and ate it. And so there's, there's a group, there's a few researchers now that are starting to try to be able to diagnose. Um, it, it, it's very much like forensics, where you can look at clues on bones, what marks are on the bones, how much of the bone is eaten. Um, and then, so somebody, somebody asked if I'd be able to deduce a certain amount of knowledge about the animal's health. Sometimes you can do that. Um, it's difficult, uh, but you can tell sometimes if an animal has been injured, or um, occasionally you can even tell if an animal has been through some kind of nutritional stress um, based on either um, uh, particular um, characteristics of their teeth or whether um, fat is in particular parts of their bones. Um, it's more unusual to be able to do that, but it is possible sometimes. And we should mention, if this is a topic that's interesting to you, um, check back to our program from part one of the conference. There's a recording of a session with Doug Owsley and his colleagues in which he's looking at human bones and trying to deduce this kind of information about uh, the people uh, who those bo bones belong to. And you can check that out. I think you'll find it fascinating. Um, oh, I'm sorry, th there's some good questions coming in. We're going to have uh, time in just a moment. We're just going to just go rapid fire through as many of your questions as we can. So keep them coming. Okay, that's great. So, yep. And then um, I, I'll, I'll just finish up before answering some more questions with talking about some hypotheses that we plan to test. And so this is really the beginning of this research study. The aim is to have it be a long-term study where we um, can spend a couple of weeks in Kenya every year and um, continue to do our bone censuses. Um, so we wanted to see if the mammal community and bone communities are correlated from the years that we have mammal community census data from. Um, are the changes in overall predation pressure as measured by bones, do these correlate to documented changes in the predator community over time? So here's another check with um, uh, uh, observational data and census data that we can do. Um, and then we can look in each habitat to see if predation pressure, pressure as measured by bones. And, and the basic way to do that is um, the level of damage on bones. You know, the average level of damage on different sized animals can tell you about predation pressure. Um, and um, do the, does this also match with observations of carnivore behavior? So there is a large carnivore research project going on on this game reserve. So it'll really um, uh, be able to, we'll really be able to ground truth these methods and then be able to take them not only a little bit further back in the past in these, this ecosystem, but potentially to other places where they don't even have animal census data to be able to look um, in the past and see how biodiversity has changed over time. Brianna, this is really fascinating, and I like that you're sharing with sharing with us a, a work in progress because mm -hmm. it really kind of takes us on your journey with you. Um, there are some students at uh, uh, Coffee uh, Middle School who had a great question. Mm -hmm. Do you see more older 
and younger, uh, older or younger carcasses? In other words, are you mm. uh, learning anything about survival of the fittest in the environment? That's a good question. So um, the answer is yes, certainly. Um, and lions are the most common predators. Zebra are the most common prey. And um, we do often see older um, and especially younger um, animals. And, and even in some of my earlier studies, I had found that lions um, had done some predation on pregnant zebra. So I think, you know, they can run a little bit slower. Um, so yes, I do, I do think that the survival of the fittest model um, does match up in a lot of ways. So here's a good question, and I think it's probably shared by a number of, of people, it's, and it's, uh, it's well asked. Um, obviously, you're interested in this, um, mm -hmm. but the question from, from this participant is, what is it that's most interesting, and, and what do you find most fun about the work you do? Why do you do it? Mm -hmm. Well, certainly, I think that um, uh, I'm actually um, an archaeologist, so most of what I do is working in the past and working with fossils. So being able to do, um, to look at um, a shorter term um, uh, that short-term changes in an ecosystem, which are actually relatively long-term changes for the conservationists, um, I find being able to um, uh, basically uh, coordinate and share information with the reserve management that helps them make choices about predators or helps them make choices about translocations or helps them make choices about how they're managing the reserve, it makes me feel like I'm really doing something that's very useful and helpful in terms of conservation. There was a question earlier about, um, and you talked about the, the colleague who joins you uh, at this mm -hmm. reserve doing research. Um, are there other teams or people doing the kind of research you are in other places? And if so, how, how many people are involved in this? this field? Sure. So the, it's actually a, a small but growing field. So um, the paper that I had shown before in 2009, um, that was published in 2009, there are researchers doing this work in Amboseli in southern Kenya. Um, there's a student who has just finished his PhD at the University of Chicago that was doing similar work in Yellowstone National Park in the U.S. Um, and there's another um, student who recently finished her PhD. Um, who was doing similar work on small mammals. So there's a small but growing number of us that are really looking at the match between bone communities and mammal co and living communities. I know you're, you're obviously still doing this research, but there is a good question about are you already in a position to note any dramatic changes in the number of species that you've discovered so far? And if so, what are some of those early trends you might be noticing? That's a good question. We haven't done a lot of the, the hard analysis of our data yet, but it does look like... Um, uh, that, uh, well, first of all, it just looks like that the number, that the bone community is matching the mammal community over time. And one of the things that we really want to find out is there are a few um, uh, antelopes in particular to, that are very rare in the game reserve. So one of the things we want to find out is are they getting preyed on more commonly than um, other antelopes? So um, we're not, we don't have the answer to that yet because we need to collect some more data, but it's a good question. Good question. There are lots of good questions <laughs> here. I'm very impressed with the, uh, the the kinds of thinking that's going on around around the surface bones and the, the, uh, that you've presented to us. Um, but there are one question that has emerged more than any other mm -hmm. is related to the most exciting, unusual, largest <laughs> bone, interesting bone oh. that you found. Well, I would say um, certainly coming across a recently dead carcass of an elephant, which was relatively complete. Um, that was probably one of the more, because, you know, it's a huge animal um, to be able to see. And it looked like it was actually a mother who was giving birth when she died. So I got to see, you know, what baby elephant bones look like. And um, that was probably, um, from a bone perspective, one of the more exciting things that I had seen. Um, question from uh, Annalisa. Uh, can the research you're doing be used to track evolutionary change over time? Now that is exactly where, as an archaeologist, I'm interested in going with this. So um, I am definitely interested in looking in the deep past and seeing if we can track changes in large-scale changes in ecosystems over time. So that, that is an ultimate goal, absolutely. Uh, another question. We have time for just a, one or two more, and then we're going to take a short break, and then we have another amazing session on biodiversity coming up as well. So let's just sneak in one or two more quick ones. Um, there's a question about, is poaching a problem? Uh, That's a good question. Um, the poaching is not a problem because um, the, uh, the conservancy was set up originally as a black rhino reserve. And because of that, there are um, foot, there are patrols that go out um, on foot to spot black rhinos. Every single rhino have to, has to be spotted once a month. So there are patrols on the ground all the time. So thankfully, poaching is not a problem in this particular um, conservancy. 
Uh, one more question about your background and interest in terms of other places you may have done field work. Mm -hmm. So um, Kenya is the place where I've done the most field work, but I've done a lot of um, fossil kind of excavation field work in Kenya, in Tanzania, in South Africa, in Indonesia, um, and potentially starting a project in India. So in uh, a variety of places uh, across the world, which is one of the reasons why I really love doing what I'm doing. Well, um, one of the questions that comes in from uh, one of our participants from Indonesia is, are you interested <laughs> in working in Indonesia? So, um, uh, and is there someone else already uh, d doing it? So it's a good question. I don't, I, I'm not aware of anybody else already doing this in Indonesia, but I do think it would be a really interesting place to test this, especially because um, I think certainly in, in uh, different areas in Asia, looking at tigers as a top predator and sort of seeing how um, the um, tiger predation may uh, affect ecosystems. But absolutely, I think that would be great. I'm going to go ahead, Brianna, and share some of the other questions in the chat that have been coming in, and I encourage each of you to feel free to think about those questions with each other and chat about them. I wanted to remind people that our conversation doesn't need to end during our live session here. It can continue. We do have the discussion area available on the site. Right below the area that people clicked on to enter this room to join you live today, there is a comments and discussion area, and we do encourage you to keep posting your thoughts, your questions for each other, and Brianna and others in this field on that site and uh, we'll check back in there and um, and uh, join the conversation as well so we do hope you'll continue it there's also a wonderful exhibit hall area on the site where uh, the National Museum of Natural History and uh, a, a wide range of uh, Smithsonian museums and research units have posted continued resources for exploration on this topic as well as the other three themes that we've covered so if you haven't checked that out it together with the recording of today's sessions uh, really will provide a, a great continued place for you to explore. Um, Brianna, thanks so much for this great journey into Africa and into <laughs> your work and into the bigger picture of what this all means for studying biodiversity. Well, great. Thanks. I'm glad to hear to see such great questions. So thank you. Join us in eight minutes where we'll have our next session. We hope you will join us for that session. We are going to go into the rainforest and see what we can learn about nature's most elusive animals, the animals that might not have left bones behind for us to study, uh, but might uh, be willing to pose for a photo. We'll find out what we mean by that in a moment. Join us. That's in about seven and a half minutes and uh, we'll see you then. And don't forget, our colleague Dan Porter has been illustrating today's session and we'll be taking a glimpse, an early glimpse at his capture in, in an imaginative way of our discussion with Brianna today. Thank you, Dan. Thanks everyone, we'll see you in a few minutes. You can stay right where you are.